Louis the Shameth, a king so arrogant that he appropriated the name of the Sun, so powerful that even the nobility submitted to his will, so insatiable that no mistress could satisfy him for long. Obsessed with greatness in every aspect, he strove to achieve it in love, in war, in art. But above all, he desired greatness at Versailles. He created a palace so spectacular that it eclipsed any other on earth. This is the story of how a king's obsession gave birth to one of the wonders of the world, erecting his palace in a mosquito-infested swamp, proving to the world that his will was stronger than nature itself. It is the story of a queen who lived a long and turbulent life, full of excesses and pleasures, and who until her last breath turned life in Versailles into an eternal feast for its inhabitants, transforming this palace into the epicenter of power, grandeur, luxury, and desire of all Europe. And this is its history. The incredible origins of Versailles date back to 1661, and as it could not be otherwise for Louis XIV, it all started with a party. At the end of August of that same year, the Sun King was invited to the most impressive party France had ever witnessed. The host was Nicolas Fouquet, finance minister to the crown and one of the most powerful, attractive, and popular men in France. But what Fouquet did not know was that he was about to make the biggest mistake of his life. At the time, the young Sun King, only 23 years old, had only been ruling alone for a short time. Louis had become king at the age of five, following the sudden and painful death of his father from illness. However, as a minor, Louis was no more than a figurehead. The kingdom was under the regency of his mother, Queen Anne Marie of Austria, and Cardinal Mazarin, an influential cleric who served as prime minister. That same year, Mazarin died, and the king took the opportunity to eliminate the office of prime minister and begin to rule by himself. Fouquet, worried by this decision, thought that the next minister to be removed might be him, and had the idea of inviting the king to a surprising party to win his favor and friendship. And what better place than his newly inaugurated splendorous palace? The palace, called Vaux-le-Vicomte, was the most beautiful and impressive that anyone had ever seen in France. The young female guests were a marvelous spectacle for the senses, and the dinner included dishes unknown in Europe. Fouquet dedicated all this grandeur to the king's name, certain that he would grant her favor. However, she did not count on the king's vanity. Louis XIV was, above all, a vain and arrogant man, and he was not willing to tolerate anyone to overshadow him. The day after the party, he ordered Fouquet to be imprisoned for embezzlement. The minister fell into disgrace, remaining imprisoned until his last day. His relatives were exiled, his legacy torn to shreds, and his wealth confiscated. But the king's determination did not end there. Louis XIV was not going to be satisfied with that so just a week after the arrests, he ordered the construction of a great palace, a palace bigger, more beautiful, and impressive than the one in Fouquet, a place whose festivities and spectacles could not be equaled, and where everything would revolve around the king, the Sun King. Before the reign of Louis XIV, Versailles was nothing more than a small rural region located almost 18 kilometers from Paris a region whose only distinction was its thick forests and marshes, in addition to housing a hunting lodge that his father, King Louis XV, often visited. So in 1661, the Sun King ordered his best architects and landscape architects to enlarge that hunting lodge and turn it into a marvel of luxury and refinement. And although many people he trusted doubted the wisdom of this decision, the work was carried out. The construction of Versailles was a total challenge. The site that Louis XIV chose to locate his palace was not ideal for many reasons, but the king wanted the palace of his dreams to be surrounded by spectacular fountains, lakes, and impressive trees. 
trees that were not found in those regions of France and that were uprooted and transported from other regions to be planted again wherever the king ordered. And so 17 years later, when the palace was ready, the king ordered all the nobles of France to move in. This decision to bring the entire nobility to live at Versailles might seem simply the whim of an overbearing and arrogant monarch, but it was something much deeper. During his childhood, Louis XIV had experienced the terror of the Frondas, two civil wars that caused great hardship. During these episodes, Louis learned and never forgot the truth behind the saying, keep your friends close, but your enemies even closer. Thus, by ordering the nobility to leave their lands, castles, and personal fortresses to move to Versailles, Louis made sure to keep an eye on a whole group that would not miss the opportunity to conspire against him, limiting his powers and getting all important decisions through him. For centuries, the predominant system in Europe was feudalism, a system where the king ruled over a nobility that had its own territories, personal armies, and influence. However, during the rule of the Sun King, France was an absolutist monarchy where all powers rested with the king. In this way, Louis XIV had a free hand to carry out everything he proposed and absolutely everything he did in a big way. To get an idea, during the reign of his father, Louis XIII, the French crown had an army of 30,000 men. During the reign of Louis XIV, the French army grew to a stratospheric 400,000 men, making France the largest military power in Europe. To talk about life at Versailles, we must first delve a little deeper into the personality of Louis XIV. After all, life, customs, and the way things were done in the palace were a true reflection of the king's personality. At the court of the Sun King, the parties and events never seemed to end. There was at least one banquet every night, three evenings with music and dancing a week, a daily hunt, and a myriad of spectacular events, such as ballet performances, poetry recitals, musical operas, and along, etc. In fact, Louis XIV himself participated in musical ballets and plays, where he showed off his artistic talents and his talent for dancing, a skill of which he was very proud as proud as he was of his legs, which he made them stand out in many of his portraits. Like the sun, from which he had taken his symbol, the sun king was at the center of all displays of luxury, lavishness, grandeur, elegance, and at times, eccentricity. Privacy was a non-existent phantom at court. He was surrounded by people 24 hours a day, people as eager to win his favors as they were fearful of making a mistake that would earn them the scorn, or worse, the indifference of the monarch. Louis XIV was so revered that one of the greatest honors at the court of Versailles was to be part of the Lever du Roi, or what amounts to the royal morning audience. At this ceremony, the courtiers had the honor of observing the king as he rose, washed, and changed his clothes. To make matters worse, Louis XIV hated weakness, to the point that it was inadmissible to show the slightest hint of doubt or insecurity in front of him. Although you could not show too much confidence either, as such a gesture would make you look overbearing or arrogant in front of his majesty. Disrespect or lack of politeness was also a carefully guarded concept at the court of Versailles and Louis XIV was very sensitive to detail. The most insignificant gesture could be considered disrespectful, and the king, a quiet but cold man of few words, would abhor the person who dared to take too many liberties in his presence. A very harsh punishment for the nobles who, forced to live in Versailles, tried to win the king's favors and affection at all times. Louis XIV's first love came at the age of 12. It was Marie Mancini, a young niece of Cardinal Mazarin, whom, unfortunately, he was never able to marry. As heir to the throne, Louis could not take for his wife the simple niece of a cardinal, and instead, the king's mother arranged the marriage between the young Louis and his cousin, 
the Infanta Maria Teresa of Spain. For more than 10 years, the young king remained madly in love with that first love, a love that would be the first of many, since despite being married, the king was not a one-woman man, a fact that would mark his reign deeply. It is believed that the Sun King had between 17 and 22 children, many of whom were named Luis or Luisa in honor of their father. The first offspring was born of a carnal union between him and one of the palace servants. However, soon after he would begin to choose his many mistresses among the nobility. One of the most remembered was Louise de la Valliere, whom he met when she was 17 years old and he was 23, and who was his favorite lover for much of his life. For several years, the love affair between Louise de la Valliere and the king was an open secret. However, everything changed the day Louis's mother, Queen Anne Marie of Austria, died. Shortly after Cardinal Mazarin's death and Louis XIV began to reign alone, his mother retired to live in a convent. And although she never spent too much time at court, she never approved of her son's many infidelities. Louis XIV was already an incurable womanizer, and the death of his mother unleashed his libertine and promiscuous streak even more. So much so that a week after his mother's death, the Sun King went to Mass accompanied by his two wives, with his wife sitting on one side and his mistress on the other. And if that were not enough, both women were pregnant at the same time and gave the king several children. With Maria Theresa, he had six, of whom only the eldest lived to adulthood, while Louise de la Valliere bore him four, of whom only the two youngest survived long enough to receive noble titles granted by their father, to say that Louis XIV was shameless and womanizing would be an understatement. Not content with having two of the most desired women in France all to himself, the Sun King, taking advantage of the fact that his two wives were pregnant, began a new relationship, this time with Madame de Montespan, who ended up giving him seven more children and who became, by far, his new favorite. Despite his affairs, and his passionate and frivolous character, Louis XIV respected his wife, perhaps not enough to be completely faithful to her, but providing her with all the luxuries and comforts worthy of a queen, as well as zealously fulfilling his marriage vows. However, Madame de Montespan became so special to the king that, in due course, Louis XIV rewarded her with a suite of 20 rooms within the palace, seven rooms more than the queen's own suite, Although Versailles was built to exalt the luxury, ostentation, and beauty of French high society, the truth is that living in Versailles had a dark side, and not only because of the disgusting and grotesque personal hygiene habits of the time. The court of Louis the Sheath was a dangerous place. Finding that middle ground between attracting the king's attention without making him feel underestimated or threatened was difficult and earning his ire and contempt could be just as frightening. However, if you managed to overcome these challenges, you could still be in enormous danger. That's because Versailles was filled with countless nobles willing to do anything to win the favor of the sovereign, including eliminating any potential rivals. During the reign of the Sun King, Versailles was the scene of several mysterious deaths, especially of young women, very likely to attract the attention of the monarch. One of the most notorious cases was the sudden death of the Duchess Marie, Angélique de Fontange, who died at the age of 21 and who, according to many rumors, had been poisoned by Madame de Montespan. Another similar case was the death, in 1712, of the Duke and Duchess of Burgundy, aged 27 and 30 respectively, and who died just six days apart. The Duke was the grandson and heir of Louis XIV, and his death raised rumors of conspiracy and assassination. Today, many historians believe that all of these deaths were from natural causes, specifically diseases that the medicine of the time could not and did not know how to treat, such as smallpox. In any case, the death of the young Marie-Angélique de Fontange affected the reputation of Madame de Montespan, who was quietly accused of murder 
and even of practicing witchcraft, black magic, and human sacrifice in an attempt to manipulate and control the king. King Louis XIV was a very deep and thoughtful person, and with the passage of time and age, his libertine and womanizing stage was left behind, giving way to a more religious and spiritual Louis. With time, even the captivating Madame de Montespan began to lose her charms and to be less attractive to the king. Something natural considering the years and the many pregnancies she went through. In addition, Madame de Montespan was a married woman, and over time, the king began to worry about the negative effects she might have on his image. So, after the death of his wife, Queen Maria Theresa, the Sun King got a new mistress. This was Madame de Maintenon, a woman of low status, who had been governess to several of the monarch's children and known to be a pious, quiet, and highly intelligent woman. And because of this unremarkable profile, it is quite likely that she was underestimated by Madame de Montespan or any of the many other aspirants to become the king's new favorite. After all, she was not an ostentatious and dazzling woman like the type of women Louis XIV had always chosen. Nevertheless, the king ended up admiring Madame de Maintenon's modesty and other qualities to the point of falling in love with her. The couple married years later in an unremarkable ceremony, as a marriage between the king and a woman of Maintenon's status would have been frowned upon. And from here on, the Sun King offered his new wife something that none of his predecessors could boast of, his fidelity, at least relatively. During his long life, Louis XIV ruled with authority and strength, controlling every important aspect of his people's lives. However, the last years and days of the Sun King ended up serving as a metaphor for his title. At the height of Louis XIV's power, France became the most powerful power on the European continent. But during his last decades, this power was waning, something that even affected the luxury and wastefulness that made the Palace of Versailles famous. During the last three decades of Louis XIV's rule, France was embroiled in bitter wars that led to countless deaths, misery, and popular discontent. The king lost all his heirs a few years before his death, having to choose his great-grandson as successor. And it is said that, at times, the Sun King would lock himself away alone to weep over the way things had happened. The final act began on August 10, 1715, when the king began to feel severe pain in his left leg. The chief court physician, a man named Guy Crescent Fagan, claimed that it was only a passing ailment. A very different opinion from that of Georges Maréchal, the royal surgeon, who thought that such a situation would bring misfortune. And he was not wrong. Eleven days later, noticing that the pain did not subside, Marshall found a black spot on the king's foot it was gangrene. Thus, for the next 23 days, the Sun King agonized, dying in life as he was enveloped by a smell as strong and repugnant as that of death. I have lived among the people of my court, and I want to die among them. They have followed the whole course of my life. It is only right that they should see me end. His great-grandson, a little five-year-old also named Louis, was given the crown of France and the burden of living up to the greatness, distinction, and all the great achievements the Sun King reaped during a long, long life. Have you visited the majestic Palace of Versailles? Or would you like to? I'd love to hear your opinion. You can write it below in the comments. And if you liked this video, you can leave us a fantastic like and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any of our exciting trips to the past. Until next time, history buffs!